Good morning. We are, uh, before we actually even officially convene this morning, we will begin with a presentation of the colors. We have a very uh, special occasion for the presentation of the color guard this morning. Uh, I would ask if people would stand and please remain standing until the flag leaves the chamber. States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Order, arms. I have asked Petty Officer Kevin Rose if he would introduce our color guard this morning. Thank you, sir. Good morning, I'm Petty Officer Rhodes from the United States Strategic Command, Color Guard. On lead rifle this morning is Petty Officer Keach, U.S. Navy. Carrying the American flag is Sergeant Pullman, U.S. Army. Carrying the Army flag is Sergeant Bolin, U.S. Army. Carrying the Marine Corps flag is Sergeant Barrera, U.S. Marine Corps. Carrying the Navy flag is Petty Officer Garrett, U.S. Navy. And carrying the Air Force flag is Tech Sergeant Casella, U.S. Air Force. And our rear rifleman is Seaman Bess, U.S. Navy. Thank you all. Uh, we have a resolution that goes along with this. I would ask if people would remain standing, please. And Mr. Cavanaugh, would you please call the roll? Commissioner Boyle, Commissioner Borgeson, Commissioner Kraft, Commissioner Morgan, Commissioner Rogers, Commissioner Tushin, Mr. Chairman. Here. Thank you. Uh, we do have a resolution that I would like to vote on while the color guard is present, and I have asked Frank Becken, Bracken, excuse me, from our Veterans Service Office to come read the resolution. Thank you, and good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Resolve, whereas the nation's 3,068 counties provide a variety of essential public services to communities serving more than 300 million Americans, and whereas Douglas County and all counties take seriously their responsibility to protect and enhance the health, welfare, and safety of its residents in sensible and cost-effective ways, and whereas Douglas County honors and thanks our residents who have served this country through military service, and whereas county government delivers many important services to America's veterans, military service members, and their families, including physical and mental health, housing, employment, and justice. And whereas the National Association of Counties is the only national organization that represents county governments in the United States, and whereas the National Association of Counties has encouraged counties across the country to actively promote their own programs and services, and whereas Douglas County and the National Association of Counties are working together to restore their partnership among all levels of government to better serve American communities. Now, therefore, be it resolved by this Board of County Commissioners, Douglas County, Nebraska, that this Board hereby proclaims April 2011 as National County Government Month, serving our veterans, armed forces, and their families, and encourages all Douglas County officials, employees, schools, and residents to participate in county government celebration activities dated this fifth day of April 2011. Thank you. Is Thank there, you. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Mr. Kavanaugh, would you please call the vote? Commissioner Boyle, yes. Commissioner Kraft, yes. Commissioner Morgan, Commissioner yes. Rogers, Commissioner Tricia, yes. Mr. Chair. Yes. Thank you all. Uh, at, that, at this point, we will uh, dismiss the color guard, uh, but please remain standing while the flag is present. Detail. Right. Face. Forward. March. Mark 
Thank you all. If I was smart, we would adjourn right here and now. Nothing is going to top that this morning. Uh, at this point, I would announce that this meeting is being conducted in compliance with Nebraska's open meeting laws, and there is a copy of the Open Meetings Act on the back wall. Uh, now, we will recess as the Board of Commissioners uh, and convene as the Board of Equalization and get back to our normal agenda. Mr. Kavanaugh, would you please call the roll? Commissioner Boyle, Commissioner Borgeson, Commissioner Kraft, Commissioner Morgan, Commissioner Rogers, Commissioner Tusha, Mr. Here. Chairman. Here. Golly, that's a nice way to start a meeting. I, I so appreciate the color guard coming down to share with uh. um, Item A is the minutes of the Board of Equalization from last week's meeting. Item B is to set one week from today as the meeting for a hearing on certified assessment correction. Okay. Questions or comments? Uh, could we please vote? Thanks. Motion passes. Thank you. This is the opportunity for citizen comments regarding Board of Equalization. If there's anyone present wishing to address anything for the Board of Equalization, uh, not on the agenda. Otherwise, we will move to the <coughs> resolutions, D through G, uh, and adjournment, unless anybody has anything they would like pulled out for individual attention. Motion from D through G and adjourn. Can we please vote? Motion passes. Thank you. Now we will convene again as the Board of Commissioners. Although we were just recessed, I'm going to skip the roll call since we've we've already okay we've already had roll call for it. Do I have one recess a day, can't you? <laughs> <laughs> Of the country schools we specialize in recesses. <laughs> uh, minutes and claims. Uh, item A is the minutes from last week's board meeting. B is the claims for payment through today's date. Uh, and item C is uh, claims for payment. Uh, being listed as exceptions. Motion to approve A, B, and C. Second. Questions or comments regarding any of these items? Then could we please vote? Motion passes. Thank you. This brings us then to the consent agenda uh, with item B and I stricken from the agenda. So there's a total of 11 items. Motion to approve. Second. Is there any items in here anybody would like to pull out for individual attention? If not, could we please vote? Motion passes. Thank you. Now, under recognition and proclamations, we have the resolution that we already read earlier uh, regarding the the theme of county government month being serving our veterans, armed forces, and their families. Uh, but I have asked uh, Commissioner Tusha from the County Government Awareness Committee if she would update us on in some of the activities that are going to be going on this week. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, I'm just going to read you a quick uh, census of what we have going for the month of April to honor all the veterans and their families. Of course, today, April 5th, we did have the resolution and we had an all-service color guard present the colors to us and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. On April 8th at 10 a.m., we are going to have a rededication of the flags out on the Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. And we will also have um, the uh, Patriot Riders joining us on that day. So that'll be a, be a brief ceremony. So I would appreciate anybody who would like to come. Also, and, and these are, when you say Martin Luther King, you mean uh, the plaza. It's, it's, yeah, these are the flags right out here yeah, from the Civic yeah, Center we're talking about. Thank you. About. Um, with the rededication of the flags, we will have the Benson JROTC to help us uh, with the flags and the rededica rededication. On April 12th, we have the American Legion Post 331 that will be here at the county board meeting to lead us in the pledge and post the colors. 
April 15th, we have several churches in the area, in the media area, that will ring the church bells at 12 o'clock noon to honor the military and their families. On April 19th, we will again have the color guard to present the colors and lead us at the Pledge of Allegiance at our board meeting, and that will be by Northwest High School, JROTC. On April 29th, we will have a final ceremony, again starting at 10 o'clock a.m., again in the location of the Martin Luther King Jr. Courtyard. Uh, at that time, we will have a wreath that will honor all veterans who have served and passed away. And then throughout the month of April, starting here probably yet this afternoon and during the next couple of days, we will be collecting personal items for the shelters that they asked us for. They uh, will have different locations with boxes in, and then we'll be doing this from the 5th to the 22nd, and then afterwards a couple of us will be getting together and, and dividing up the personal items and taking them to the, a variety of shelters. So that will be honoring National County Government Month and honoring all the veterans passed away, served, and all their families, and I thank you. Well, thank you, Commissioner Tusha, and thanks to the whole committee uh, for, for all of their work on this. We will move down to the committees uh, and, and begin. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I forgot. <laughs> Dr. Poor, excuse me. <laughs> the State of Public Health in Douglas County by Dr. Adi Poor, our Health Department Director. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning, Doctor. And uh, I know uh, you are celebrating uh, County Government Month, but I also want to tell you this is Public Health Week. <laughs> uh, so a lot of celebration to do, and it is STD Awareness Month. And uh, the theme actually for Public Health Week is safety is no accident. And so uh, we are sponsoring a workshop on Thursday night with uh, the city prosecutor, U.S. Attorney's Office and Omaha Police Department to talk about gun safety. And uh, so but what I'm going to talk to you about today are two folds. Uh, first of all, I always want to tell you a little bit what is the state of public health at the beginning of the year and what are the priorities for the health department. And uh, today I'm also adding a second portion to it that talks about the county health rankings that you may hear from your colleagues. It's a, an effort that started last year uh, for all the more than 3,000 counties across the nation. This first slide is really just to indicate to you where, again, governmental public health is unique in that it receives uh, 44 different diseases by state statute are reported to the health department. And what the reason for that is, is to make us aware of potential outbreaks that, can, that occur earlier than we actually see the outbreaks, or as early as possible, so we can put prevention measures in place. Uh, I don't expect you, some of these numbers are very small and are fluctu fluctuating quite a bit. Uh, there are a few things that I want to point out to you. One of them is that we have some uh, Campylobacter outbreaks in spring and what we'll do is we'll actually this year really uh, try to address this early on in the community by providing some prevention messages. We have cryptosporidium uh, cases uh, where we are now doing more data collection to try to see if it is related to a body of water, to a swimming pool, or to a recreational area. Uh, there are some good things. We are seeing less uh, uh, genital herpes in our community than we have seen for a long time. We still battle with uh, pertussis, and many of you who have children in the school systems may have received notice that, that uh, sometimes uh, a child with pertussis is presented to a school. We then send out a letter that goes to those parents to be aware of it and potentially, if necessary, provide a chemoprophylaxis to those children in the same classroom. 
These are the five health priorities that the health department has based on data in uh, 2010. Asthma, obesity, lead, STD, infant mortality, and two overall goals to eliminate health disparities and uh, be a community that is prepared for public health emergencies. I want to show you some of the data. I'll go through it pretty quickly because uh, uh, I probably have too many slides in here. But anyway, the goal for asthma was that we would decrease the asthma, asthma death rate rate. And when you look at the results here in the middle column, you see that we have made some progress in that. On the bottom here, you see the specific activities, how the health department in this case responds to indoor air quality calls from private citizens, but also uh, investigations that are related to businesses where a whole group of employees may say that they have gotten ill and they think it is related to their work re uh, requirement environment. This is just graphically showing to you how the death rate has increased. The red line is the state of Nebraska. USA data is lagging behind. Uh, and what you can see, it's actually a pretty good story that we have seen our death rate uh, of asthma decreasing. This is when we look at it, how it is related to our population. And what we see is we still have a huge discrepancy in health disparity in our African-American population versus our white. And that is the reason why uh, the Board of Health declared uh, they still would like to have this as a priority in uh, 2011. So we'll keep that as a priority. Infant health is an indicator of the overall health of the community and uh, we usually say if we can take care of our youngest individuals, how can we take care of all the other instances that occur in the community. Our goal is to decrease infant mortality and more specifically one of the main factors of infant mortality is sudden infant death syndrome. Our goal is to decrease that to a point three per thousand uh, live birth. And as you can see in the results too, it's a good story because uh, we actually have decreased our SIDS death. Now I have to tell you, when we prepared these slides, uh, since then we have received some more reports of individuals uh, SIDS death that occurred in 2010, so that number actually may slightly change. We have a pretty impressive collaborative in this community with hospital systems to try to address this from every angle. We have a, a program called FEMO, the Fetal Infant Mortality Review Board, where every case of infant mortality is reviewed by an expert panel, try to determine do we see some commonalities between these infant deaths, and then how can we address those. This is the death rate again, as I said, pretty. But when you look at the infant mortality rate, again, we do have a health disparity in our community, uh, specifically in our African-American community. With SIDS, it's actually the same. STDs, uh, I know uh, I'm always most interested to see what the data shows us there, and of course a lot of efforts are going on in our community. Since uh, 2004, since the peak of our STDs, we have seen a decrease in chlamydia of 3.9 incidence rates and a decrease of gonorrhea rate by 34%. I want to share with you a little bit some of the activities that have been uh, that we have been doing in this regard, uh, mainly awareness and education in our community, and uh, actually have reached specifically more than 10,000 youth in our community. We have developed two DVDs, one that where young people talk to young people about the risk of uh, risky behavior, and one for parents because we have heard and you have heard me say that sometimes parents do not have the tools to really. Uh, talk to their uh, children in an open and comfortable way. Uh, we worked with uh, Nebraska ETV on this uh, and uh, it, it, the DVD is coming out in the next month. Focus on Youth is another best practice that has been used and is recommended by the Center for Disease Control. It is one of those programs that empowers youth to make the right choices, empowers them to do not only STDs, but empowers them again to be strong when they move on in their life uh, expectancy. 
Non-traditional testing, we have done over 1,827 individuals that we tested in the community where the youth are. Instead of expecting that they come to us, we actually go to the youth. These are youth events. Some of them are small, some of them are big. We are now one day a week in Washington Library, and the children recognize that, young people recognize that, and if they want to, they can be tested for STDs. On the, of those 1,800 individuals, some of them we tested and they received a T-shirt because they wanted to get a T-shirt to go into a certain concert. A hundred of those children were positive. So that tells you that these were not individuals who went to a clinic because they thought they had a risk factor. Those were individuals actually who just took the test because, like I said, they wanted the incentive that came along with it. So that's a 5% positivity rate. 37% of our positives in this group were between 15 to 18 years of age. These are the graphs you have, me, uh, you have seen some of these before. What it shows is the blue line is again our Douglas County rate. As you can see, it is actually 30% higher than the U.S. rate. It is 70% higher than the Nebraska rate. This again uh, kind of depicts the disparity that we see in STDs. Uh, what we like to see, however, again, that in every population, the there is not an increase in the rate, but potentially either it's leveling off or there is a decrease. I want to warn you also there is going to be a slight change once the 20, uh, 2000 uh, census are, 2010 census are going to come out. This is gonorrhea, a little bit a better story. We see a decrease in our gonorrhea rate uh, last year and we hope that that is continuing. Again, however, the health disparity, we see most of our uh, gonorrhea cases in our African-American population. Next question we have, why, so what is the age group that is really affected by STDs? And I just put the chlamydia slide on here for you. 60%, 70% of our individuals with chlamydia are 15 to 24 years old. Let me say that again. 70% of the positive cases of chlamydia are 15 15 to 24 year old. This one on top of here shows you how many uh, chlamydia cases we have had last year. We have had 2,819 cases. Chlamydia is a reportable disease. Le either the laboratory or the physician needs to report to us so we know that we have a pretty good handle on it. Some of our, in our community are saying, well, this is only an East Omaha issue. I want to show you these uh, two zip code maps and uh, what we have done. We have lumped uh, 2004 to 2009, and we have done the next map, uh, 2006 to 2010. What it clearly indicates to you that we have STD in every zip code in, Nebraska, in Douglas County. So every zip code, uh, we do have cases. Childhood lead poisoning is a priority for the health department because uh, we are the largest Superfund site in regards to uh, lead poisoning. We, uh, our goal was to screen 16,000 children last year. We didn't make that goal. As you can see, we screened 14,766 children. We have gone back, looked at where uh, the lag in screening occurs and have identified those clinics and are starting to work with them to really bring that up to what it needs to be. Our goal is to investigate every home that has a child with an elevated blood lead level in it. And so we did investigate 92 homes where we actually go in, do a risk assessment, identify the lead exposure and the lead risk, and try to uh, provide information for the individuals to eliminate those risks. Those are not remediation. They are not expensive type of uh, uh, activities that need to be done. Usually they can be low cost, usually it may have to do with a line or in the window drafts or so, or repainting, uh, but uh, usually that is beneficial and the children then do not require further treatment. These days physicians very rarely treat children anymore for elevated blood lead levels because we really don't see those high levels anymore where chelation, which is the clinical treatment for elevated blood lead levels, is really not recommended. 
This is just a map that shows you how nicely we have increased where in 1996 we screened 2,867 children. We are now above 14,000. It tells you our health care providers have really stepped up to the plate, have realized that, that this is an issue in our community. This is again a zip code map and uh, the light green area is the area that is declared Superfund site and what you see of course no surprise those are the areas also where we have the highest number of children with elevated blood lead leads. But I want you to recognize there are zip code area 68064 that had a child with an elevated blood lead level. There are some out here even in Western uh, Douglas County too. So it doesn't mean just because you live in this area or you live in western part of the county that you do not need to have your children tested. You know that Senator Council has a bill in the legislature where, uh, that would require every child to be led tested before entering school. Last year in 2010 we had 167 children that had elevated blood lead levels. That is 167 children too many. It is an absolutely preventable disease and we shouldn't see any cases anymore. Obesity, of course, is one of our priorities, and we are not different than any other counties. In 2010, we did again a survey where we asked individuals over the phone, what is your weight and what is your height, and then calculated the body mass index. And as uh, I see some of you smiling, how honest are you going to be when somebody calls you on the phone and says, and what is your weight? You're going to try to remember when you were kind of at the low point. So potentially this is an underestimate uh, of it. Of course, you recognize uh, and you know we were one of 44 communities last year who was awarded a community pudding prevention grant uh, for $5.7 million over two years. The the grant is really to bring everybody around the table. We have 19 partners who work with us. Very little is remaining in the health department of those funds besides a coordinator and our business section who needs to uh, run all the, the bills and so on. Most of it is really going to organizations in our community to develop policies and programs. The suggestion, uh, my suggestion to the Board of Health and the Board of Health have approved it that as a new indicator next year, we are going to use uh, diagnosing uh, anybody diagnosed with diabetes. As you can see, when I looked at the data from 2005 through 2009, we see an increase in uh, individuals, adults who have been diagnosed with diabetes. So one in 10 at this time is diagnosed with diabetes. Definitely something that we need to address and also is related, of course, to obesity. Health disparities, a lot of prevention activity going on. I just want to put your attention to two things, Omaha Table Talk, kind of a, a conversation that goes on sometimes in family homes with a very diverse group of individuals to start to learn from each other and appreciate diversity and also feel comfortable about it. And then uh, the health department has a stand for chronic disease self-management program where we try to teach individuals how to for themselves take care of chronic diseases. Public health emergency preparedness, we had a very good year. We got uh, an audit by the Center for Disease Control and a score of 98% on that for readiness. I want to shift to these county health rankings just because through NACO you may hear about them. It's an effort that Robert Wood Johnson has undergone with the University of Wisconsin Public Health Institute. For the second year in a row, they have tried to determine what are some factors that we can compare counties with counties. And they have two areas that they are looking at. First are the health outcomes of a county and then the factors that actually can relate to the health of that community. And I just showed you under here what are some of those health factors. They are health behaviors such as tobacco use, diet, exercise, alcohol use, safe sex. They are looking at clinical care and they are giving uh, that a weight of 20% access to care and quality of care looking at the social economic factors and giving that a 40 percent uh, weight and then the physical environment uh, gets a 10 percent weight and so the same measures are being applied to all these 3,000 counties and then the counties compare themselves within the state 
So this is actually for the health outcomes, meaning mortality and morbidity. And as you can see, the darker the color, the worse the outcome. And actually, uh, Douglas County is number 58 in Nebraska. And I think why I put this slide up, A, people like to see where, where the county is compared to others. But what is very interesting, we have neighbors. We have Washington County, we have Sarpy County, who really have much better health outcomes. So just living in a county right next to you can make a difference. And the phrase is, it matters where you live. This is then the health factors, and there Douglas County is doing a little bit better. We are, I think, number 32. But again, look at the counties that surround us, Washington, Sarby, Cass. They are actually, again, better in their ranking. And this is just the ranking so that you can kind of see who are number one, number two. I put Lancaster County on there because often we try to compare ourselves. Uh, health outcome, Lancaster County is number 16. As I said, we are number 58. And the last county that they were able to uh, evaluate in Nebraska because of the population density is Thurston County. It's the last county. Health factors, you see Seward and Kearney number one, and uh, Douglas County actually number 32, and we were number 51 in 2009, so we have made some progress, but it really has to do with a measurement that is not being taken into account anymore this year, and that was uh, alcohol outlet density. Last year, alcohol outlet density was a measure that uh, these uh, scientists decided to look at, and we didn't do very well on that one. They dropped it this year because they couldn't really uniformly address it, and therefore it brought our rankings up. Just a little bit, I think what is interesting when you look at all these health factors, we are number one in regards to clinical care. That is the ratio of uh, family practitioners to the population. And I think that shouldn't surprise us. I mean, I would have been very surprised if we wouldn't have been number one because we are a healthcare community. We have great physicians here and we have plenty of them here. But what it also tells you is that even having good health care doesn't make you the healthiest county. And that is what we learn more and more. There are these what we call the social determinants of health, meaning everything is interrelated into a community. You can't just look at one incidence. And so this shows you a little bit uh, what this is all about. I remember last year when I came to this board and I gave you uh, this snapshot of the county health ranking. I remember Commissioner Boyle say, well, you know, I don't really want to be compared to Thurston County or any of the counties in Nebraska because they are rural counties. I would rather you would compare us to counties that are comparable to our size and to the urban environment that we have. So what I did is I looked at some of the counties that I thought may be representative, may be similar to us. And this is to a certain degree actually a little bit good news because you could get frustrated if you just look at this data and see we are not making any progress. But what it shows you is that several of the counties, and what I did is I put Lancaster County on there just as a comparison, but I put Polk County, Shawnee County, which is Topeka, Kansas, and Ramsey County on there. What you see is that many of the same indicators and the same percentages are present in these type of urban counties. It also seems that some of the drivers of health, are, of the health factors, are STD rates and teen birth rates, and those two go hand in hand. Uh, you can see how well we are doing. We have 466 residents in Douglas County compared to one family primary care physician. So uh, very, very nice ratio. But what you see, these counties, we all struggle a little bit with the same health uh, indicators. 
this is no surprise to you. Uh, again, high school graduation has an influence. Children living in poverty has an influence. How many grocery stores and farmers markets you have actually could be related to the health because if you have more access to those type of uh, avenues, you probably are more likely to buy more fresh fruits and vegetables and live healthier than if, if you only have a McDonald's next door to you. Uh, higher rates of unemployment, uh, of course, are also a factor that is seen in these unhealthy counties. I want to close just to tell you what I see for the health department, some of the challenges. Our obesity initiative will be ending next year, so it is a challenge. A uh, lot of policies are starting to be put in place. We have more than 100 businesses who have signed a memorandum of understanding to say that they are implementing one policy at least in their business. That can be, can be that they allow their employees to do physical activity, could be that they they provide them a pass to a gym at a lower rate. It could be that they have vending machines that now have healthy food in them. It could be, as we are doing, that the healthy choice is the easy choice. So at this time, for example, that they wouldn't allow uh, at any type of luncheon to have uh, sweetened beverages be served, but it, that it needed to be water tea or coffee. Uh, so there are many of these policies that businesses are putting in place and I think that is where to a certain degree your role comes in too. If we make it easy for individuals to make that healthy choice, to walk uh, to a place, it is much more likely that we are going to be able to change that behavior. We cannot tell people how to behave, but we can make the environment inducive so that they want to make that right behavior change. We know we'll have challenges with teenage risk behavior. We are actually just writing a grant again this afternoon uh, for a program and see if we can do some more of this empowering the, the kids, the young uh, teenagers, to make the right choices that then helps them to live a productive life. Health disparities efforts are going on. Uh, we are going to furthermore measure some of our programs that we started with LED. We actually just received a grant through the College of Public Health. We are going to do an evaluation of that grant to make sure in these times of limited resources that we only do programming where if we really see an effect. Otherwise, I think this, these are not the times to do new pilots, not knowing if we really can make a change. Impact of healthcare reform. There is a big component in healthcare reform in regards to prevention because I think everybody realizes that if we do not prevent these diseases like obesity, it's not that we want to fight obesity as itself. We want to change the chronic diseases that are related to obesity. It's not so much that we want to change chlamydia rates. We know chlamydia are a preventive factor for infertility. In the United States, I just read an article yesterday Yesterday. We are spending $5 billion a year annually on infertility. And we know that chlamydia can actually lead to infertility. It can lead to pelvic inflammatory disease. That, again, can be directly related to infertility. There are some great studies now coming out of Britain that show that. So we are going to have funding challenges, but I think if we have a road in front of us, we know what the priorities are to make a difference in our community. Hopefully with your assistance, we can get there and uh, walk that line. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Parr. Any questions or comments? Appreciate seeing the progress. Thank you. We have citizens' comments on the agenda. Is there any citizens present wishing to say anything to the County Board of Commissioners that is not on the agenda? If not, now we will move on to the committee discussion and action and start with the Finance Committee under Commissioners Kraft and Morgan. Anything to report? We are three quarters of the way through the fiscal year. Uh, we're pretty much on target. We're still working with meetings and having um, discussion with the department heads on next year's budget. We're going to do some follow-up meetings next week. And other than that, I have nothing else. Commissioner Morgan? No, I think uh, there's areas uh, that we do have 
tremendous concerns about, I think, on the uh, um, juvenile court matter and, and some of those areas, and that's something that uh, there isn't a lot of opportunity to make uh, change on with the outside attorneys, et cetera. We've had some good discussions about that, but uh, what Mark said is pretty much as it is, and we'll have meetings uh, pretty much all next week, yes. every day. Very good. Thank you. Meetings every day. Maybe that's why Steve Walker is no longer with us. But, but, but good luck, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Boyle. Uh, yes, I wanted to ask if uh, um, there are some plans to conduct the budget hearings in public. Well, the meetings that we're having are open meetings. Uh, um, yes. We're, we are going to have, after these preliminary meetings, we're going to have the budget meetings here. Okay. When you say have the budget meetings here, tell me what, what you envision. Do you envision the sheriff coming down and talking about his budget? Yes. Okay. So each individual elected official and department head will be appearing at a public meeting in this setting, I at a county that, board meeting or something? I, that is, I would like to see that. If they want. Party. I mean, if, you know, they've done the reduction and they feel there isn't anything to say, I would assume they may not. But we'll do whatever... Uh, the commissioners want and you request? Well, the reason I ask is there are some reductions I want that uh, we came close last time, but uh, there's reductions that I want to discuss publicly, and the, it is important that the department heads or the elected officials be here because it affects their departments. I think they need to justify uh, their spending, um, and they need to do it in a, you know, I don't mean to, I'm not going to sandbag them, give them plenty of time to get their act together, but. Uh, couple departments and the elected officials know what I'm talking about, for example, the certification in two departments and some other things that I'd like to see justified. Um, it may mean um, doing some, uh, and I'm going to talk to the chair about it, but doing some auditing of what we're spending, truly spending for some of this activity. But I think it needs to be out in the public because we need to, we're going to have to choose priorities this time. You know, uh, are we going to buy more cruisers or are we going to um, start to merge the sheriff's office with the Omaha police, for example? I mean, there, we can't, I don't think we can continue doing business the way we are. And I want that discussed in public. I don't want it to come to me anyway after the decision's been made, which is what's been happening. So I feel okay. the hand being patted, and my head being patted saying, you know, it's already done. And I, I don't want that to happen this time. That's, uh, you know, and I wasn't here, but that's right. not the intent. And I think, uh, Joe, if, if there's some of those departments, however you want to do it, to be yeah. sure, because somebody could say, hey, I've made the 4% cut, I'm not coming there. If you feel like, hey, I'd like to see those, if you let Mark or myself or Joe know, we'll make sure that that's they'd like, we'd like to have them here, if that's good. the wish of the board. Is that... That's fine. Plus, there's nothing to prevent you, and you know this, from talking to the different department heads on a one-to-one. -one. Are you and another commissioner or two also? Uh, just as a finance committee, we're getting the preliminaries trying to guide, well, first of all, trying to understand right. what their difficulties are in achieving the goal, if they're having difficulties, what the repercussions are of achieving the goals if they receive if they achieve the goal through uh, not using what I call truth in budgeting. I want truth in budgeting. Right. I don't want to say we're going to cut the prosecutor's office and then have to give them a supplemental budget because they've let people go then have to out hire outside sources. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, and, and that's what could happen in juvenile court. That's what can happen in the prosecutors. That's what can happen in the public defenders. So I want this to be a truth and budgeting budget. I do too. And, and last year was probably the worst I've ever seen. The deal was made before I was even talked to. Uh, the budget was put together and um, I was talked to as if I had a, a role to play in it, but the deal was already done and the four votes were in place. So that's what I want to avoid this year. Uh, I want to be a part of it, and I want the public to be aware of it. so that We, we are. I, I don't want to see this as a public flogging as we've right. done in the past. To some of the commission, uh, to the, some of the department heads, uh, if there's public, if there's flogging to be done, do it in private. No. But uh, uh, I, don't I don't want to see this as 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 a vendetta against any one or two departments. And, and I think everybody knows where we stand on certain departments. 
Yeah, and, and asking questions is not being vindictive. Uh, asking questions and asking, getting answers is just... Asking qu the same question 60 times is... <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll try to make it 58. Okay, very but, good. Uh, I, I just think the information needs to get out there because we're going to have to oh, choose priorities. This, this is a very tough year, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank and, you. I appreciate it. And Mark, what you said about, like, the juvenile court, we don't have choices in that matter. We went through some of that. There aren't the real options yeah. as far as uh, that. Uh, but rather than when you said meeting with them one-on-one, -on -one, I think what uh, Commissioner Boyle is saying, hey, he'd like to make sure it's an open meeting here that we talk about it. I guess that's more the request, so we need yes. to be looking at that. And when would that take place? Because I'm not as familiar as all of you. Would that be in May or June? That, that would be coming up in May or June, yes. Yep. Okay. And there will be lengthy meetings. Okay. That okay. sounds good. Thank, Thank you. I can hardly wait for May and June. <laughs> 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 yeah, I think I'm busy, sorry. <laughs> okay, um, next with anything listed is the Human Resources Committee. Uh, Commissioner Rogers, anything you want to be sharing with that? No, item one is as presented and really doesn't have much effect because of the hiring freeze, so <laughs> it's there for public notice. Uh, item two is legislative issues. Um, you've been distributed the report from... Um, the government affairs firm and also uh, unless there's something anybody has particular um, <coughs> purpose to bring up to bring attention to I know executive session will talk spe specifically about the latest CIR but other than that I think everything else is noted in the report very good thank you I, I gotta say as I've been watching the legislature I sure had no idea that they don't follow the same kind of open meeting laws that they tell us we have to follow. The, the CIR bill still is not public yet because it hasn't been to the floor. I, I'm amazed at, at how they operate compared to how they tell us we need to be operating. Um, okay, is there any anything else for the good of the cause? I believe we are ready to uh, adjourn into executive session. So move. For purposes Second. of litigation personnel and negotiations and le legislative matters I think uh, well yes that, that falls under those okay under those categories there will be at uh, one o'clock this afternoon uh, Commissioner Rogers will be chairing a child and youth services committee in room 903 of the Civic Center with that could we please vote on adjourning into executive session recessing into executive session Thank you.
motion passes.